Chapter 21 Advice to World Leaders To wrap up what I've been discussing, I will remind you that the soul does not need to give her permission to be transported in this way. She has already surrendered herself completely to God. She has willingly delivered herself into His hands, and she knows that there is nothing she can do to fool Him because He knows everything. Things are different here on earth. There is so much deception and duplicity here. A certain person persuades you that he is your friend, and then you find out that it was all a lie. Who can live in a world so rife with deceit and betrayal? The more you care about worldly things, the more difficult it is. Blessed be the soul the Lord brings to an understanding of the truth. If only world leaders could enter this exalted consciousness, it would be so much more worthwhile for them to strive for this state of prayer than for all the power in the world. What righteousness would prevail in a nation like this? What atrocities would be avoided? Any man who reaches this stage has such unshakable love of God that any fear of risking his honor or his life falls away. This is an especially great blessing for someone who has the obligation to lead his community. Such a king would be willing to lose a thousand kingdoms if God would increase his faith by a fraction of a degree and give him the opportunity to shine a little light of faith into the hearts of the doubters. And rightly so. The benefits would be so much greater than worldly dominion, a kingdom without end. One drop of water from that place makes everything here on earth seem vulgar. Imagine if the soul were totally immersed in that water. Oh, Lord, even if you were to give me the authority to proclaim these truths publicly, no one would believe me. No one believed those who expressed themselves better than I have. But at least it would satisfy me to have a real voice. I would count my life as nothing if it meant that I could clearly communicate even one of these sacred teachings to the world. Who knows what I would do after that? I am not to be trusted. In spite of what I am, I keep having these irresistible impulses to speak the truth to political leaders. But since I do not have access to these men, I turn to you, my Lord, and beg you to make all things right. You well know that I would gladly forfeit all the blessings you have given me and transfer them to these rulers as long as I could remain in a state where I would never offend you. If they could experience what I have experienced, I know that it would be impossible for them to allow the violations they have been condoning. Oh, my God! Please help world leaders understand the magnitude of their responsibilities. You have singled them out. I have heard it said that when a powerful ruler dies, there are signs of his death in the heavens, as there was a sign in heaven when Jesus died. My heart quickens with devotion, my king, when I realize that you have provided these signs to show world leaders how important it is to walk in the footsteps of the Lord. I certainly am growing bold, aren't I? Please. Tear this up if it sounds bad to you. Believe me, I could say this a lot better in person if only they would listen to me. I sincerely pray for our leaders, and I would like to be of some help to them. Such an urge makes a soul reckless. I would gladly risk my life to gain what I believe in. Living is empty once we have seen the grand delusion with our own eyes and realize what suffering comes from walking in blindness. Once a soul has attained this level of prayer, she does not merely desire to serve God. His majesty gives her the strength to manifest the desire. The soul would not hesitate to try anything that might be of service to him. Any sacrifice for his sake feels like nothing, because she knows that anything other than pleasing him means nothing. The trouble is, that people as worthless as I am don't find many opportunities to do something useful. 
May it please you, my God, that the time may come when I will be able to repay you a speck of all I owe you. May it be your will, O Lord, that this servant of yours actually serve you in some way. Other women have done heroic things for love of you. I'm no good for anything but talk. This must be why you don't put me to work, my God. Everything with me adds up to nothing more than a bunch of wishes and words about how much I should be doing for you. The best of my intentions give me no relief, since they are always coupled with fear of failing you. Before you do anything else, good of all good, my Jesus, fortify my soul, then help me to help you. Who could bear receiving so much and giving so little? I don't care what it costs, my beloved. Please don't let me come into your presence empty-handed anymore. Shouldn't our reward be in proportion to our deeds? Here is my life. Here's my honor. Here's my will. I give them all to you. I am yours. Use me as you will. I know all too well, my beloved, how little I am capable of. But now I have reached you. Now I have climbed the watchtower, and I can see truths I could not see before. Now I can accomplish anything as long as you don't leave me. If you leave, even if only for a brief time, I will go back to where I was, which was hell. It's excruciating for a soul who has found herself in this place to return to the mundane world. This life looks like a farce. It feels like a complete waste of time to have to deal with physical needs like eating and sleeping. Everything wearies the soul, and she can't figure out how to escape. She sees herself as a prisoner in chains. Now she understands why St. Paul besieged God to free him from the body. Her cries join his, and she begs God to liberate her. This condition is so intense that it seems as if the soul were straining to break free of the body and go off in search of this freedom. No one else seems to be willing to deliver her. The soul wanders around like a slave sold into captivity in a foreign land. What distresses her most is that she rarely encounters anyone else to join her in her complaints and prayers for freedom. Everyone seems to want only to live. Oh, if only we could be more detached. If only we didn't derive our satisfaction from any worldly thing. Then the pain of living without the one we love and the yearning to live a true life would mitigate any fear of death. If a woman like me is so often brokenhearted in the face of my exile, I wonder sometimes what the saints must have felt like. The charity I have given has been tepid and my deeds have not assured me of true rest. What did St. Paul and the Magdalene and others like them go through? The fire of love was blazing in them. It must have been a state of perpetual martyrdom for them. The only people who bring me any comfort are the ones I encounter who have the same desires as I have and accompany them with actions. I mention action because there are people who consider themselves detached and broadcast this fact, long years of spiritual practice and conformity with religious dogma would suggest that they have attained some degree of perfection. But even from a distance, the soul can tell the difference between those who have nothing but words and those who have confirmed these words through action. She understands what little good the first group does and how much work the second group gets done. I have already told you about the fruits of the raptures that come from the Spirit of God. The truth is, some of these effects may be more and some less. What I mean by less is that in the beginning some of the effects of rapture may not be proven with actions. This makes it impossible to prove their authenticity. Raptures cause the soul to grow in perfection. They banish every last trace of cobwebs. This takes time. As love and humility flourish in the soul, the flowers of virtue spread their perfume for the enjoyment of this soul and of others. Actually, the beloved can work such wonders in a rapture 
that the soul is left with almost no work to achieve a state of perfection. Only those who have tasted this experience will be able to believe what the Lord Himself gives to the soul at this stage. In my opinion, nothing we can do will bring us to this place. I am not denying that a person who makes a concerted effort on the spiritual path will, with the help of God, achieve some degree of detachment and transformation. There are many benefits to be gained by diligently implementing some of the methods taught by authors who have written about prayer. But it will be a laborious process and will take much longer. In rapture, without our doing anything, the Lord lifts up the soul and transports her from this earth. Even if such a soul deserves these favors no more than I did, God gives her mastery of all earthly things. I cannot overemphasize my own lack of merit. I had almost none at all. Why does His Majesty do this? Because He wants to. And He does it the way He wants to. It doesn't matter whether or not the soul considers herself to be ready. His Majesty will prepare her to receive His blessing. Just because a soul has cultivated her garden well does not necessarily mean that she has earned rapture. Although it is absolutely true that anyone who takes good care of the garden and strives to be detached will be blessed. But sometimes it is God's will to display His great glory in meager soil. He so thoroughly prepares the ground of a wretched soul that she is incapable of turning back to her former life of offending Him. The mind has grown so accustomed to dwelling on the real truth that anything less feels like a game of make-believe. Sometimes the soul laughs to herself when she sees serious men, men of prayer and religion, making a big deal about some minor point of dignity or honor that she has long since trampled underfoot. They claim that it is a matter of discretion and that the more prestigious their status, the more good they can do. The soul understands they would do far more good in one day than in ten years if they thought a lot less about their authority and simply loved God. Thus, the soul walks a troubled path, bearing many crosses, but she experiences rapid growth. Her companions think she has reached the summit, but then God grants her new favors and she ascends even higher. The soul is his soul. He is in charge. He illuminates her. It seems that he is guarding her against offending him. He helps her to wake up in service of him. When my soul reached this sublime state, all the evil in me disappeared, and the Lord gave me the strength to walk away from my bad habits. It no longer bothered me to be exposed to temptation and to spend time with people who used to distract me. It was as if these occasions for error were not excuses for missing the mark at all. In fact, what used to do me harm was helping me. Everything was an opportunity to know and love God better. Everything reminded me of what I owed Him, and this prevented me from going back to the way I was. It all happened so quickly. I knew that I had nothing to do with my dramatic spiritual progress. His Majesty, in His great goodness, had blessed me with His favors and given me the strength to handle them. From the day the Beloved gave me my first ecstasy to the present moment, He has been increasing my strength. In His kindness, He has held my hand so that I would not turn back. It seems to me that I don't do anything now. And it's true. He does it all. I believe that a soul in this state could be in the company of any kind of people and not be thrown off course. As long as she receives God's favors with humility and gratitude, always bearing in mind that the Beloved gives them and that she herself does almost nothing, she will retain her equanimity. Even if people are unconscious and corrupt, the soul will not be disturbed or enticed. On the contrary, the experience will help her to grow. These souls have grown so strong that God has chosen them to serve others. As the soul comes nearer to God in this place, He communicates very deep secrets to her. 
With ecstasy come true revelations. With ecstasy come great favors and visions. All this phenomena humble the soul and fortify her. They dilute her attraction to the things of this life. They give her glimpses into the magnificent life the Lord has prepared for those who devote themselves to Him. May it please His Majesty that the boundless generosity He has heaped on such an ungrateful wretch serve as an inspiration to those who read this to give up everything for God. If the rewards His Majesty bestows on us even in this lifetime are so radical, imagine what He has in store for us in the next. Chapter 22 Sacred Humanity If you will permit me, there's one more thing I'd like to say. I think it's very important, and if you think so too, you can draw on it whenever you need to give some advice on this subject. That could happen. Books on prayer suggest that the soul is ultimately capable of lifting her own spirit with tender humility and raising it above all created things. The authors acknowledge that this can only happen after the soul has spent years purifying herself, the purgative stage, and has begun to receive God's light, the illuminative stage. They admit that the flight of the spirit is a totally supernatural phenomena that God works on the soul, but they recommend ways in which the soul can contribute to her evolution in prayer. Here's what they say. Get rid of all physical images and contemplate pure divinity. Even the thought of Christ's humanity, they say, is an impediment to perfect contemplation. They use what Christ said to his disciples at the time of his ascension to support their theory. It seems to me, by the way, that if the disciples had faith that he was both God and man, as they did after the Holy Spirit came to them, his form would not have been an obstacle. After all, he had no need to speak these words to his blessed mother, did he? And she loved him more than all of them. The theologians I am referring to think that since contemplative prayer is entirely spiritual work, any corporeal thing can hinder it. Contemplatives, they advise, should try to think of God in a general way. He is everywhere, they say. We are immersed in Him. This is good, sometimes, but I cannot bear that we should withdraw completely from Christ or place His divine body on the same level with all created things and our own earthly miseries. May His Majesty give me the ability to explain what I mean by this. I don't mean to contradict this theory about contemplative prayer. These authors are learned and spiritual men, and they know what they're talking about. God leads souls by many different paths. It is not my place to meddle. I can only speak about the way God has led me and the danger in which I placed myself by trying to put some of the things I was reading into practice. I do believe, however, that people who have not passed beyond the stage of visions and raptures are inclined to think that formlessness is the best path. This is what I used to think. But there is a level of prayer that transcends union. If I had adhered to the practice of formless contemplation, I never would have arrived where I am now. In my opinion, this practice is a mistake. Maybe I'm the one who is mistaken, but I will tell you what happened to me. I didn't have a spiritual director when I was reading those books on prayer, and I thought I was getting somewhere on my own. Later, of course, it became painfully apparent to me that, unless His Majesty gave me some understanding through experience, books were not very helpful, since I didn't know what I was doing. So when I began to experience the prayer of quiet, I tried to banish all corporeal associations from my mind. I still felt too wretched even to dare to elevate my own spirit. I thought that would be presumptuous of me. I believed, though, that I felt the presence of God, and I did feel it. So I endeavored to recollect myself in His presence. 
The prayer of quiet is a lovely prayer. If God lends his assistance, it brings unspeakable delight. Since the fruits I derived from this prayer were so delectable, no one could possibly have convinced me to return to meditating on the humanity of Christ. I would have considered this only an impediment. O oh Lord of my soul and my highest good, O oh crucified Christ, I cannot look back on this opinion of mine without terrible pain. What was I thinking? I feel like I became a traitor. But it was a matter of sheer ignorance. I had been deeply devoted to Christ all my life. This effort to transcend His humanity came fairly recently, just before the Lord began to grant me all those raptures and visions, and I didn't keep it up for very long. I easily returned to my customary practice of praising the Lord, especially when I received communion. I wished I could keep a painting or a statue of Him with me at all times, since His image was not as deeply etched in my soul as I would have liked. Is it really possible, my Lord, that it entered my mind for even an hour that you can be an obstacle to my greatest good? Where have all my blessings come from if not from you? I cannot bear to think that I was at fault in this matter. It makes me so sad. I was only a victim of ignorance. And so you, in your goodness, decided to remedy the situation by sending me someone to correct this error. Later, you allowed me to see you so many times that I couldn't help but understand how severe my mistake had been. This moved me to convey this truth to everyone I could and to write it down here. In my opinion, this rejection of sacred imagery prevents souls who have already tasted the prayer of union from evolving beyond that experience and attaining radical spiritual liberation. I have a couple of reasons for thinking this. Maybe I'm not saying anything at all. But I learned this from experience. My soul was in terrible shape before the Lord flooded it with His light. His blessings were coming in small packages. Once I had opened them, it was over. I didn't have the companionship of Christ to sustain me through the trials and temptations that inevitably came up. The first reason I think it's a mistake to dismiss all images is that it shows a lack of humility. It's such a subtle lack and so well concealed that it could easily go unnoticed. Who could possibly be so proud and miserable that after he had spent a lifetime engaged in ardent prayers, penances, and persecutions, he would fail to feel anything other than joyous gratitude when the Lord allowed him to remain at the foot of the cross with St. John? I was that proud. I was that miserable. Only stupid people like me would be anything other than deeply grateful for this honor. When everything should have been going right for me, I made it all go wrong. Sometimes our health or our temperament keeps us from being able to dwell on the passion of Christ. It is excruciating. But what stops us from being with Him in His risen state? We have Him so near to us when we participate in the Blessed Sacrament. He is already glorified here. We don't have to gaze upon Him when He is weary, broken, and bleeding, exhausted by the side of the road, persecuted by the people for whom He did so much good doubted by his own apostles? Who could bear to think about his suffering all the time? Behold him free of suffering here, full of glory, about to ascend to heaven. As our companion in the most blessed sacrament, he strengthens us and gives us courage. It does not seem possible for him to leave us even for a moment, ever. Under the pretext of serving you, my beloved, I abandoned you. I did not know you when I was offending you. But once I came to know you, how could I have thought it was a good thing to reject you so persistently? What a bad path I was walking. I realize now that I was not on any path at all until you brought me back home to you. When I saw you beside me, I saw all blessings. Once I looked at you as you really were, Standing before the judges, there was no trial I was not willing to suffer. 
Whoever lives in the presence of such a good friend and excellent master, one who stepped forward to be the first to suffer, can endure all things. The Lord helps us. He gives us strength and never fails us. He is a true friend. After my encounter with Christ, I clearly saw that God wanted me to receive His blessings through the sacred humanity of Christ, in whom His Majesty is well pleased. I have learned this truth over and over again through experience. The Lord has told it to me. I have definitely seen that this is the gate I must pass through if I want His Sovereign Majesty to reveal great secrets to me. And so, even if you have reached the summit of contemplation, you can trust that if you take this path, you will walk safely. All the blessings we seek are available through this Lord of ours. He will teach us everything. All we have to do is look at the example of His life. Unlike worldly friends, this friend will never abandon us in our labors and our troubles. What more could we want than to have such a companion by our side? Blessed is the soul who perpetually keeps him near her. Think of the glorious St. Paul. It seemed that the name of Jesus was always on his lips. That's how close he held his Lord in his heart. Ever since I had this realization, I've been carefully considering the lives of some of the great contemplatives and saints. I see that they also took this path. St. Francis through the stigmata, St. Anthony of Padua with the infant, St. Bernard rejoiced in the sacred humanity, as did St. Catherine of Siena and many others. You would know this list better than I do. Of course, the path of turning away from forms must be a good one if so many spiritual teachers advise it. But in my opinion, it's only appropriate when a soul is very advanced. Until then, it is best to seek the Creator through His creatures. The ability to transcend the physical depends on the particular blessing God grants each soul. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the most sacred humanity of Christ, which should not be equated with ordinary corporeal things. I wish I knew how to explain this clearly. Once God decides to suspend the faculties, this presence is taken from us. Even if we desire to hold on to Christ's form, all forms fall away. We accept this. Blessed be such a loss that enables us to fully enjoy what we seem to be losing. Only then is the soul completely engaged with loving the one the intellect labored in vain to know. Then she loves what she did not understand. Then she rests in a joy she never could have experienced unless she had lost herself to gain herself. But I don't think it's right to give up the wholehearted effort to keep His sacred humanity present with us at all times. May the Lord grant us this blessed presence. Otherwise, the soul is left floating around in the air. No matter how filled with the divine she may think she is, she is completely ungrounded. Living human beings need human support. Remember, lack of support can lead to lack of humility. That's when people try to elevate the soul before God elevates it. They are not content to meditate on something as precious as Christ's sacred humanity. They long to be merry before they have worked with Martha. When the Lord wants to raise up the soul, even if it's the very first time she has ever practiced prayer, she has no reason to be afraid. But let's cultivate our consciousness. This minuscule lack of humility may seem to be nothing, but it does a great deal of harm if you're trying to advance in contemplation. Bear in mind that we are not angels. We have these bodies. It's crazy to desire to be angels while we are still on earth, especially if we are as earthbound as I was. Our thoughts generally need something to anchor them. It's rare for a soul to become so transported, so filled with God that she doesn't need any forms to hold her. During those times when it's difficult to maintain our equanimity, such as when we are negotiating business or enduring persecution or experiencing spiritual aridity, Christ is a very good friend to have. We can picture Him as a man, 
and identify with his weaknesses and his troubles. He keeps us company. Once we have begun to develop this habit, it's easy to find him beside us when we look for him. There will be times, though, when we are neither capable of finding Christ nor of transcending form. When this happens, it's a good idea to cultivate the detachment I've been talking about and not go rushing around in search of spiritual consolations. Embrace the cross unconditionally. This is the best thing. Christ was deprived of all consolation and abandoned in his suffering. Let's not abandon him again. He can support us far better than we can support ourselves. In his hands, we will ascend to great heights. When Christ determines that it's appropriate to remove himself, he will remove himself and allow his majesty to draw the soul beyond herself and beyond all forms. God is very pleased to see a soul humbly accept his son as mediator. He appreciates it when a soul loves his son so much that even when his majesty desires to elevate the soul to the highest level of contemplation, she questions her own worthiness. Depart from me, Lord, says the soul with St. Peter, for I am a sinner. I am a living example of this. It is the way God has led my soul. Other souls find a shorter route. I have discovered that humility is the ground of prayer. And the deeper the soul bows down in prayer, the higher the beloved will lift her up. I do not remember a single time when he bestowed his favors on me that I had not first been overwhelmed by my nothingness. His majesty has revealed truths to me that I could never have imagined, truths that help me to know myself. I believe that when a soul meddles in the prayer of union in hopes of furthering her own progress, she will quickly trip and fall. Unless her foundation is solid, she may think that she's doing something useful, but she's actually hindering her progress. I'm afraid such a soul will not achieve true poverty of spirit. True spiritual nakedness means putting down our tools and resting in aridity. Having already given up looking for earthly comforts, we now give up our search for consolation in prayer. The only solace we seek is participation in the trials of the one who lived a life of trials. The consolation this gives us should not cause us pain and agitation. This is what certain souls suffer when they become overly attached to their efforts to find devotion through their intellect. They think. If they're not always striving and laboring with the mind, they're failing. As if they had any control over God's blessings. I'm not saying they should not make every effort to be in God's presence. But if they can't even conjure up a decent thought, they shouldn't kill themselves trying. Who do we think we are? We are only his servants, powerless. But this is what the Lord wants. He wants us to acknowledge our powerlessness and behave like those little donkeys some people employ to propel the water wheel. Even though they are wearing blinders and have no idea what they're doing, they draw more water than the gardener can with all his busy labor. Our job is simply to place ourselves in God's hand. Then we can walk our path in freedom. If His Majesty calls us to His secret chamber, we should joyfully go to him. If he doesn't, we should be content to serve him through humbler tasks and not always try to sit down in the best seat. God cares more about us than we care about ourselves. He knows the best fit for each of us. Once we have delivered the whole of our will into the hands of God, why would we presume to direct our own life? In my opinion, our interference does more harm here than in the earlier stages of prayer. These blessings are supernatural. If a person has a bad voice, forcing herself to sing is not going to make it better. But if God gives her a good voice, she doesn't even need to practice. She just opens her mouth and makes music. Let the soul surrender to His will and trust in His great goodness. Let her always ask him to grant us his grace. 
Once she has received permission to sit at Christ's feet, she shouldn't budge. Let her stay there as long as she likes. Emulating the Magdalene. If she is strong, God will lead her into the wilderness. This explanation should be enough to satisfy you, at least until you find someone with more experience and more knowledge than I have. If you encounter seekers who are beginning to receive tastes of the divine and think they are the architects of their own spiritual growth and gratification, don't believe them. How gloriously God reveals himself when he chooses to, entirely independent of our petty little efforts. No matter how much we try to elevate ourselves when God decides to carry away our spirits, it is like a giant lifting a piece of straw. We are incapable of resisting. Wouldn't it be strange if a toad believed it could fly of its own volition whenever it wanted to? It seems to me even more difficult and arduous for our spirit to lift itself up to God unless He chooses to raise us up to Himself. The desire to fly does us no good as long as we are weighed down with a thousand earthly burdens. It is true that flying is more natural to us than it is to a toad, but we have become mired in the muck and have lost our ability to soar. I'd like to conclude by saying this. Whenever we think of Christ, we should think of His love. It is with love that He has bestowed so many gifts on us. It is with love that God has given us such a sign and promise of His great love. Love gives rise to more love. Even if we are just beginning on the path and are still very wretched, let us strive to carry this divine love with us wherever we go and to increasingly awaken ourselves in love. If the Beloved decides to bless us by pressing the seal of His love into our hearts, everything will be easy for us. Heavy tasks will become light, and we will finish them quickly. God knows how much we need His love. In the name of the great love He revealed to us through His glorious Son, and in the name of the love Christ demonstrated for us at such a high cost to Himself, let His Majesty give us His love again and again. Amen. I just need to ask you one question. When the Lord begins to grant such sublime favors to the soul, when He places her in a state of perfect contemplation, for instance, shouldn't she become immediately and irrevocably perfect? Simply by virtue of the fact that someone who tastes such a blessing by definition loses all craving for earthly consolations, it seems like this should be the case. Why is it such a gradual awakening? The more raptures and other divine favors the soul receives, the more sublime are their effects and the more detached the soul becomes from the things of this world. The same Lord that blesses the soul with these experiences could sanctify her in an instant. Instead, He perfects her virtues little by little over time. Why? This is what I'd like to know, since I have no idea what the answer is. I do know there is a big difference between the degree of fortitude God leaves in the soul in the beginning, when the rapture is over in the twinkling of an eye and its effects are almost imperceptible, and the power instilled later on when the transport lasts much longer. I often think this must be because we are incapable of preparing ourselves all at once. The Lord steadily fosters the young soul until she has developed the resolution and strength of a mature being, capable of trampling all worldly things under her feet. What he did in a short time for the Magdalene, he does more slowly for the rest of us in proportion to the effort we make to allow him to do his work in us. Let us not stop believing for a minute that God will reward us a hundredfold, even in this lifetime. Here's another metaphor that occurred to me. Since the divine favors more advanced practitioners receive are the same as those given to beginners, we could compare these favors to some common food that everyone eats. People who eat just a little are left with a good taste in their mouths for a short time. Those who eat more derive some nourishment from it. And the ones who eat abundantly draw life and strength. In fact, this last group eats the food of life so often and is so filled by it 
that no other food could possibly satisfy them. It is obvious to them how much good it is doing them. Their palates have so completely adapted to its sweetness that they would rather starve than eat anything else. Ordinary foods only detract from the exquisite taste this good food leaves in their mouths. Encounters with holy people are like this too. Such exchanges are far more beneficial when they occur over many days than when they last only one day. If our conversations are prolonged, we take on the qualities of our saintly companions, God willing. It all depends on what His Majesty wants and who He chooses to bless in what ways. The important thing is that anyone who begins to receive divine favors needs to make up her mind to detach herself from the world and cherish these blessings as they should be cherished. It seems to me that His Majesty is testing us to see if we truly love Him. First, He challenges this one, then that one. If our faith has faltered, He may reveal Himself with such sublime joy that it quickens our faith by offering us a glimpse of what is to come. Look, He says. This is only a drop in a vast sea of blessings. He leaves nothing undone for those he loves. Once he sees that they have accepted his gifts, he gives of himself without end. He loves all who love him. What a good beloved we have! What a good friend! O oh Lord of my soul, who has the language to explain what you give those who surrender to you? Who could ever express the terrible loss of the ones who attain this state only to lose it by holding on to themselves? I know that this is not your will, Lord. You prove this by visiting a dwelling as meager as mine. May you be blessed forever and ever. If you decide to share these teachings on prayer with other spiritual people, please, I beg you again. Make sure that they really are spiritual people. If they are only familiar with one road or have gotten stuck halfway, they will not be able to understand what I am saying. God leads some people along a very exalted path right from the beginning. Then they think that everybody else should walk the same way, quieting the intellect, avoiding all forms and images. But by following these practices, some people end up as desiccated as dried-out husks. There are others who experience a taste of quietude and jump to the conclusion that they have achieved this on their own and can do it again whenever they want. Instead of evolving, these souls slide back. So, experience and discernment are always important. May the Beloved in His goodness grant us these qualities.